So uh, I'm going to just, uh, the table of contents is like, I will have a background. I will say something about oceanic languages, which is a group of languages uh, where the language I work on uh, is spoken. Um, and I will talk about semantic field work and uh, give some conclusions. So uh, we're talking about this area of the world. Um, basically, we're talking about uh, a family that's called Austronesian family of languages. Um, so as one of the main things in linguistics, what, one of the ways linguistics actually started as a discipline was to look at how languages are related genetically. So can we trace back uh, as much history as we can and what similarities we find among languages? And this is how we can identify uh, relations and families, uh, affiliations between languages. And one of the biggest families in terms of like geographical spreadness in the world is the Austronesian family. And you can see uh, this whole area where we see red uh, is where we find languages who are related in this way. So we have like the whole of the, um, uh, the Southeast Asia uh, and then the whole of the Pacific. So we have this whole a huge area of the world that's covered by these languages. Um, and um, the, the way we can find out that these languages are related, what we call genetically in linguistics, is looking at the lexicon and the way this lexicon, uh, can we trace back the words uh, that could be of the same origin in a big number of languages. And here we can see an example of a word that we, um, when we use this asterisk, we mean to say that this is a word we presume had, had it existed at some point in time in the past, um, and it can be found in many different languages. In this case, in around 200 languages um, that are Austronesian. And in this small example, you can see a few languages that belong to a subgroup of these Austronesian languages uh, that is uh, considered to be oceanic subgroup. Um, and for instance, the way you can identify these similarities is by looking at words that mean similar things. So we presume that there is some kind of, that this was indeed the same word uh, in the past. Uh, so for instance, in uh, one uh, language you have tan, which means down. Then you have something like ran, tan, and we, we see that the meanings are sort of related to earth, down, ground, soil, and then after a lot of work <laughs> that comparative linguists uh, did here, uh, they sort of mapped out uh, an entirety of many, many different words that are related in this way um, and understood that this might be uh, one whole like genetic relation between these languages. Um, and to just get a more geographic idea of this again, we can look at the Austronesian expansion, so mapped together with the considered migrations between these peoples and their languages. So these were the these were people who were seafarers, but as far as we know, they basically used canoes <laughs> to travel around. Um, and their origin is considered to be uh, Taiwan, uh, like, and they would have been in Taiwan three thousand um, years, uh, like five thousand years ago, three thousand BC. And from then on, you can see these different arrows in the map that show different waves of migration. So we would have going south, uh, going towards uh, Indonesia, uh, and uh, eventually also going towards Madagascar, um, and then spreading out gradually, so in a stepwise uh, fashion, throughout the whole of, of the Pacific Ocean, uh, reaching as far as the um, eastern um, islands uh, near Chile. So this is like, and these all languages are related. Uh, this is pretty amazing. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't know that much about these languages, be also because they uh, have been fairly, fairly recently discovered. So the colonization uh, started uh, in the 18th century, I think, so with the discovery of Australia and then the um, missionaries uh, started going to the Pacific and so on. So what I'm going to be talking about, the Vanuatu, the archipelago I'm going to be talking about is here, and this is the region of Melanesia. And I, I have a bit more detailed um, maps afterwards. So now we're going to talk about this a subgroup of languages. So here, this is a, so Austronesian is a whole family, right? Uh, but then if we focus on a more um, on a smaller part of this uh, geographic area, we find the sub subgroup of oceanic languages. Um, so in the Pacific, we have these three areas that are basically geographic areas: Micronesia. 
Melanesia and Polynesia and oceanic languages spread across the whole of this area. They're all considered to be oceanic because they're more closely related than the rest of the Austronesian languages. Um, but they don't, so there are some other languages in this area of Melanesia. There are, for example, Papuan languages, which are considered, considered to have a different origin. Uh, but still the oceanic would go all around the coast of Papua New Guinea here and uh, throughout the, the Pacific Ocean. Um, and here again, we can see here Vanuatu, which is, uh, consists of several small islands. Uh, so if you're interested to know more about the oceanic languages and how these subgroups work and just how complex this is, well, this is like a tree. It's, so we can, by building these relationships between languages, we can build different kinds of like subgroupings that resemble a tree. Um, and you can, for example, go to the Glottolog website where you can see all these different um, groups that then split into smaller and smaller and smaller groups until we reach Oceanic, then we reach North and Central Vanuatu, and then if you click on that, then you reached uh, eventually the language that I will be talking about that was my, uh, the focus of my work in my PhD. So this is the map of Vanuatu. Um, as you can see, there are several bigger islands. A lot of them are, most of them are of volcanic origin. And in fact, most islands do have a volcano, uh, not the one I worked on, fortunately. And uh, this is the island of uh, Efate, where the capital Port Vila is. And this island does not have volcanic origin, uh, but it still has a lot of volcanic soil and um, uh, things like that. Uh, so a bit of a history about the country. It gained independence in 1980 from an Anglo-French condominium. So it was shared between Great Britain and France. Um, and as a, as a heritage of that col colonial history, uh, the national language is a Creole language based on English, which is called Bislama. Um, and also people very often in school, they learn either English or French uh, besides speaking the Creole. But Everyone also speaks an indigenous language uh, that is the native language of that particular island or that particular part of the island. Because for a country that only has uh, 272,000 um, people, we have 138 indigenous languages, which makes an average of about less than 2,000 speakers per language, which is very little compared to uh, what we see in Europe and um, the Western world. And just to give you an idea of how, for example, the Creole of Islam sounds. Um, so all the lexicon, all the words are English uh, or have English origin, uh, but they have their own grammar and they have changed according to some of the grammar that resembles indigenous languages. So you can say something like, mi sabe tok tok bislama. So me comes from me in English, but it means I. Save, no, which comes from French, savoir. Talk, talk comes from talk, but then we have it reduplicated, which means speak. Languis is also like language. Uh, belong is, uh, comes from belong, but it means of Vanuatu. So you can see how we find a lot of similarities uh, between uh, English and, uh, and the Creole, uh, but in fact, they do have distinct grammars. So this would mean something like, I can speak of Islam, the language of Vanuatu. So this is just a small example because we're going to be talking, in fact, about an indigenous language that I was studying there. Um, and this language is spoken on, it's called Napsan, which means language. And it's spoken on the island of Efate. Uh, so we have here the capital, Port Vila, which is the biggest city in the country, but still pretty small uh, and pretty underdeveloped for um, Western standards. And then the, the villages around the city is where the language is spoken. And these are Pango, Erakor, and Eratap. And these are all coastal villages uh, that where people mainly... Uh, th this is actually the most developed area of the, of the island because it's pretty close to the city, so there's still electricity and uh, running water uh, in this area. But the rest of the island, just for you to get an idea, does not have electricity or running water. Um, okay, so what did I do there and uh, why did I go there? Well, uh, field work, so linguistic field work, uh, is, um, it has the aim of going to the country, so like anthropological field, field work does as well, and documenting the language uh, and describing it in terms of its linguistic structure 
uh, and usually this is these are the languages that we don't know much about so in some cases they're actually completely unknown or are not described uh, by linguists. Um, usually the earliest records we have of these languages are missionary records, uh, like uh, writing, uh, translating the Bible, for instance, or some sort of church-related documents. Uh, and so in the case of Nafsan, uh, there is a previous grammar that my supervisor at the University of Melbourne already did, and he did field work for this. Uh, so he described the grammatical structures of the language. Uh, but still, there's a lot we don't know about Nafsan because it's what we call in linguistics underdescribed, which means it does not have the history of study, just like, for instance, European languages. Um, and so what happened recently uh, is that people who work in semantics, which is a study of meaning uh, of different structures uh, in language, uh, what we're interested in is relating fieldwork of these languages we don't know much about and relating it to semantic theories and relating it to semantic meanings that we already know of in uh, European languages, for instance. Um, so basically, we call this now semantic fieldwork uh, because it's a field, fieldwork based approach in semantics. Um, and the idea behind this is that we create carefully created semantic context, contexts. So uh, we create uh, more precise contexts that are supposed to elicit from the speaker the meaning uh, that we're interested in. And this is especially important uh, when it comes to grammatical meanings, because if you just want to know how to say a cup, you show the cup, you're like, how would you say this? And the person says, and that's a bit more clear than uh, finding out how do you use past tense or how do you use present tense, how do you use future? And if you studied any foreign language, you know that this um, can be pretty elusive to really know when exactly to use which grammatical category. Um, and so this is why we create these semantic contexts in different, uh, with different methodologies. Uh, so the two methodologies I will mention today are storyboards and questionnaires. And I will show that uh, in the next two slides, uh, how this works. Um, so the focus of my research um, on this, uh, in, in this sense is studying the gr grammatical categories that are expressed by verbs. So um, which so for instance, this would be like I mentioned present or past tense and in this, uh, in this particular talk, I will focus on a perfect. Uh, you probably know of perfect in English like past or present perfect. Uh, I have done that already. I have been to Paris. That's, that would be perfect in English and you also have it in many other European languages. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, I'm going to be focusing on uh, that kind of grammatical category. And, but the more underlying question behind this is, why, do, why are we even going to Vanuatu? Why do we have to get antimalarials and like go through so much trouble? Well, we want to know as much as we can about all the existing languages of the world. And we know so little uh, so far about many of the areas of the world. And we just want to know, uh, do these grammatical categories have anything uh, in common? with other languages of the world? Can we relate what we know about English or German in any possible meaningful way to what we will find out um, in Vanuatu? Um, so just to give you an idea of perfect that I mentioned now and uh, that I'm going to like exemplify uh, further with uh, these methodologies that I use at Fieldwork. So uh, when we talk about any grammatical category, we want to know, we want to break it down to several more nuclear meanings because we can't just say, oh, this is perfect. Because if you ever studied any foreign language, you know that it's not enough to just kind of get it. You really have to go context, context by context and, and really figure out um, when to use it, uh, right? Uh, so we can break, for example, perfect in English, we can break it down to several meanings. And these are the commonly assumed meanings um, related to, to this category. So for instance, we have present perfect, which is something like John has arrived. We would call this a resultative meaning which means that we have some kind of result of the John's arrival. It's different than saying John arrived at 3 p.m. In this case, we're saying he's here, here now, right? Um, then we have what we call experiential meaning. We have something like, have you been to Paris? And what we mean by this is, have you ever been to Paris in your life by, uh, so far? And there is no other grammatical category that can express this. So what I mean by grammatical is that we have a verb have, which is an auxiliary, and then we have been, which is a participle. And these two together, that's the grammatical category of uh, perfect in English. 
then we have something we call universal meaning, uh, which would be something like, I have been living in Berlin since 2016. So uh, it started at some point, um, but it's still going on. Um, and then we have something uh, that talks about a very recent event. And this is called uh, hot news. Um, and we could say something like, I have just arrived. And here we have to use something like just or um, to indicate this recent, recent event. And then we have other types of perfect that, uh, with other tenses like past perfect, where instead of had, we would use had, right? So this is the past tense. Um, and this would indicate something like anteriority, something happened before something else happened. Like when the alarm rang, I had already gotten up. So I got, I, me getting up happened before alarm ringing, right? And I can achieve this by using had already gotten up. And I could not say it's just with simple past in this particular context. Uh, okay, so uh, how did I elicit this? How did I ask speakers about uh, how do you say this in your language, right? Because the question is, these are very abstract meanings. You cannot come to someone, well, even someone who is a, an English language speaker, you couldn't say, how would you say the resultative? How do you say the expiration? You have to really make the speaker come up with a meaning without, be, uh, without him going into metalinguistic uh, understanding um, of this, right? Uh, so uh, one questionnaire that is commonly used in linguistics is, for these kinds of meanings is called the DAL questionnaire. Uh, so DAL, the linguist who uh, came up with, with a, like a series of different questions you can ask. Um, and one example of this, uh, the meaning I mentioned, the experiential meaning, you can ask it, for example, by saying, you meet <clears throat> my sister at any time in your life up to now. And the idea here is that if you just, this has to be, of course, this is a translation, translation exercise. So the person has to speak English, this is the assumption, um, but meet is not, uh, it it's, uh, doesn't have any tense on it. So you, if you say met, you're already biasing the speaker to think about past, but if you just say meet, and because the rest of the sentence tells you at any time in your life up to now, the speaker is prompted to understand it's about, that that's the meaning you intend, right? So here the speaker is supposed to say whatever, uh, sounds natural in their language and you can offer them like do you want to say several options is there one option which sounds the best and so on and this is what i did uh, this painstaking uh, exercise with my speakers and there's a picture of us uh, and this of course was done with speakers who really knew english quite well and who also didn't mind uh, spending uh, like hours on end discussing uh, what meanings and um, what things you can say in their language now the problem is with this is that first they have to speak English, <laughs> which most people don't speak uh, so well. Uh, and the second problem is not everyone has this understanding of what you're actually asking them. Most people in other parts of the world aren't as um, comfortable asking random, uh, answering random questions and just uh, discussing them in such an abstract manner. Um, you know, uh, so basically what you want is a method that works a bit more with like any speaker or any level of English uh, knowledge. So for that purpose, I used another method, uh, which is called the storyboards. So in storyboards, I designed a series of stories that have uh, pictures. And so basically you come up with a story uh, where you insert these sentences and these particular meanings you want speakers to express. So just like the one, have you met my sister, you meet my sister, you would insert it in a story where that kind of makes sense. Uh, and then you create pictures associated with um, each part of the story. And this way, when you present it to the speakers, you first tell them the story the way you think it should naturally sound in either English or Bislama. And I did this mostly in Bislama because people are more um, comfortable speaking that language. Uh, and so then after you tell them the story, they sort of, they know the meaning of it, but then when they tell it the second, when they try to tell it the second time, uh, I record them and uh, I let them speak without looking at the text. So they are not, they're effectively telling the story from memory and from what seems more natural in their language. So this way you're not biasing them towards translating something directly from English or thinking about whatever it, it, it should be from Islam. So there is, there's as little translation bias as possible in this case. So just to give you an example, 
uh, here is a story that I called Making Lop Lop, and Lop Lop is a national dish they create out of grating taro um, and then baking it in a stone oven. And so in this particular example, I wanted to test the meaning I told you about that exists in English, like John has arrived, or some kind of result. So a resultative state that is a result of some previous action. Uh, so in this case, I wanted to uh, show that uh, in, in these pictures. And here we have Lily and uh, Mary. And so Lily, uh, while Lily is grading pink taro, Mary is grading white taro. Uh, so they're both doing that, right? And then as a result of that, after some time has passed, uh, Mary says, I have graded a taro, what do we do now? So the idea is that this part, I have graded a taro, uh, as it is perfect, a present perfect in English, that if that category exists in their language, if they have a similar, if they need to, uh, you know, if they, if they needed a special word to express that meaning, they would do it here, if, if that is the same meaning as in English, right? So that's the idea, we have some kind of action going on, and then we also see the result. We see Mary is away from the, the taro, she already did it, we have the result of the taro. So this will be the meaning that I was after. It's, it's like a very abstract meaning, uh, but uh, I'm showing also some examples and hopefully you will um, understand uh, yeah, how this relates to the exactly the grammatical meaning uh, that I'm talking about. Uh, so in, in this slide, I just wanted to show you uh, the structure of a, a sentence in Napsan. Uh, so we have something like, um, it's quite different to what we know, but it also in a way it's uh, a bit more simple compared to some European languages, because oceanic languages are known to have um, less morphology. So less, you know, like no cases, no, no like uh, a lot of endings uh, being added to either verbs or, so the verbs are pretty much like one word is a verb, and then you have particles that mark tense or all these other meanings. Uh, it's not expressed on the verb itself. So for instance, you would have a, a subject marking, which is like a pronoun, but it's a pronoun that always has to be there because since they don't put anything on the verb, uh, like you would, for example, in Spanish, right? You would put, you know, if I'm speaking about myself, you or someone else. Uh, in this case, they have to put it on the pronoun and the pronoun is obligatory. Um, and so this pronoun um, then is like fused a bit, like it, uh, it becomes like one word uh, with this particle pe. Uh, and there's many other particles that can be in this uh, particular slot, you know, it can, like, they occupy this uh, place in a sentence. Um, but this one pair is what my supervisor called perfect, and I was interested in knowing whether it corresponds to these meanings that I, I talked about so far. And so then there are other things that can appear in a sentence, like you would have negation, then you get the verb, there's some other aspect particle, uh, like perfective or things like that. And uh, then the second part of negation. So it's a discontinuous, like in French, like je ne sais pas. Uh, so it's a similar kind of thing uh, that we see here. Um, uh, okay, so now th this is uh, maybe a bit more complicated to read, but I just wanted to show you how we do this uh, in linguistics, how we mark these examples. So basically my work uh, from now on consisted identifying a lot and lots of these meanings. Uh, how, you know, like having very specific contexts, so seeing what the speaker said, talking to them, then doing the storyboards, seeing what all the other speakers said, all these things. Uh, and basically what I concluded <laughs> is that it does, we do find uh, evidence that there is perfect and it's very similar to the English one. Uh, and just to give you the two most emblematic uh, examples of this, uh, we talked about the experiential meaning, having done something up to some point in your life, like uh, you met my sister at any time in your life up to now. And so in this case, uh, the speakers chose the pronoun uh, that uh, is used with perfect. So this pronoun is always used with pe. It's not used with some other particles. Uh, so, and this means the second person. So this is how we use, uh, this annotation shows you like every, you know, when a linguist sees this, it's like the annotation that tells you, okay, second person singular, perfect, PRF, and all these things like that's a, a standard. Uh, so we see that it's second person uh, perfect, pe, and then meet, uh, correct, sis, my sister one time. Have you met my sister? And I find that all speakers use pe for this kind of meaning, which tells me, okay, this is not accidental. Um, it means that this kind of meaning, it's also relevant in this language, right? It's associated with this uh, pe particle. 
Um, and then for the resultative meaning, like the one that I said in English, John has arrived or I have graded the tarot, we see that also we get kinel, I, uh, perfect particle, chi, and then pe, ma, great, and tal, su. So I have graded the tarot. Uh, and again, almost, like I think all speakers, if I remember correctly, used uh, pe with this, which again tells me that this is an important uh, sort of emblematic meaning associated with this word. Um, and now just to sum it up, I didn't show, of course, like uh, other things that uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me a bit more about some other meanings and so on. Um, but to sort of sum it up, all the meanings that I found uh, in Nafsan uh, are shown in this a map of meanings that we call a semantic map, uh, where we relate different meanings to each other, sort of like um, uh, finding a core meaning uh, of the category and then seeing which other meanings can it express uh, and how they relate to each other. Um, so we, what I found is that the resultative meaning seems to be like sort of the basic meaning, uh, like the one I said, I have graded the tarot that would be the resultative meaning. Uh, and then other meanings also uh, can be associated with perfect, but in different ways. Um, so we find uh, also the anteriority meaning, just like in English, uh, like I had when John had arrived and so on. Experiential, the one I talked about, the universal one I mentioned in the beginning. Also hot news, but uh, hot news is uh, what I showed here with the blue is that that's another category that uses, uh, th that's a whole other word that would be used for this meaning. So the, the red is pe that I talked about. All of these meanings are covered by pe, but then if we want to say something like John has just arrived, then we would use another word. So, that, so it's not exactly the same as in English because here we would use perfect in English, but not in Nafsan. Um, and just to make this a bit clearer, if you, uh, if you compare it to English, so this is the same thing, just in English. Uh, then we see that blue would be perfect in English, right? Um, and if, if we go back to Nafsan, we see, so it's a slightly different, uh, so, some slightly different meanings, uh, you know, arise in Nafsan, and it's slightly diff differently covered, but we do see an overlap that seems to be quite significant, uh, right? So we have resultative, anteriority, all this part, universal, at least four meanings are the same as in English. Um, and additionally, in English, you also have another category, uh, which is already uh, another word that can express a lot of these things and can also combine with perfect. So uh, here I have something like expectedness. I didn't talk about this uh, so far, but this will be something like you expect something to happen uh, to some degree. Uh, or something is scheduled or so, and, and you could say, I, I have already done it. It's already done, it's already over, and so on. So it's, uh, at some level, it was expected. So this, these are very, very abstract notions, but yeah, just believe me that some of these uh, meanings are actually, I mean, they're agreed in literature to be like uh, defining for these words, right? Uh, but what, we find, what is interesting about this, so we call the semantic space uh, of all these words, that you, uh, all these meanings you can see here. And what is interesting is that we do find that in English, you basically just have two different categories occupying it. Already uh, can also, like the yellow already, can also um, occur together with perfect. So we can have, I have already done that. We have, have done and have already together, right? So we have one extra category, whereas in Nafsan, we have like one category, no overlap. So that's why it extends a bit more. And when it comes to English, we have two things, and so they behave a bit differently. So the point of all of this is sort of like to see how these categories relate to each other, or is it even meaningful to talk about these categories? And um, basically my conclusion is that, yes, it's probably meaningful to talk about perfect as an interesting category that can be found not only in English or European languages, but also in uh, indigenous language, languages that are like, have bear no relation, no recent contact or any relation to European languages. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I can explain this map a bit further if anyone is interested in uh, like uh, figuring out how this uh, works. This is just sort of an illustration or a visual representation of these meanings. Um, and just to give a conclusion, uh, so basically um, I just wanted to like show you that semantic fieldwork 
<clears throat> even though it sounds a bit, in a way it sounds a bit funny, like when you take some pictures and you show it to people and so on, but so far at least, this is our best tool for discovering meanings in lesser studied languages, because as we, you know, doing this a lot, going to different places and seeing how people, uh, you know, separate chunks of either abstract meanings or even more specific meanings is what we need to really figure out um, how common some meanings are, how not common they are, and so on. Um, and by using these kinds of methods, we can uncover more nuanced meanings that can be expressed by certain grammatical categories. And we don't have to rely on our own biases, but really ask speakers and provide them the best sort of materials and do experiments uh, with them. And regarding perfect, uh, we can conclude that we can identify some common meanings associated with the perfect category across unrelated languages. And in my thesis, I also like uh, took some other languages into account. And I really uh, saw that this pattern of these few core meanings uh, are, are really widespread across uh, the oceanic languages. Um, and the conclusion is that really the perfect can be considered to be a more gener general linguistic category and it's not only limited to European languages and that's um, actually one big debate in the literature. Uh, is perfect just like an English thing or uh, what is perfect in German? That's a whole other debate. So there's a lot of debates about this category. Is it even um, a, a category worth uh, talking about and so on? And just looking at uh, something like Nafsan, I think we do have some grounds to really consider it um, a category that's worth studying um, in a whole variety of languages. So yeah, this was kind of the, I think this is it, yeah, thanks. <laughs>